Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're in our second message in our series through Luther's Small Catechism. And let's read the text that's printed for us on page 7 from Deuteronomy chapter 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Let's pray. Our precious Savior, we give you praise and thanks for your word. The word which your spirit touches and then places into our hearts and minds. And Lord, as the generations come and go, and we are part of that process, we ask that by this power of your spirit you would enable us to continue to live out your word and proclaim your truth and teach our children. In your name, Jesus. Amen. amen. The famous philosopher Mark Twain told the story about a man who had memorized the Ten Commandments. The gentleman told Mark Twain that it was his ambition to go to the Holy Land and to stand on top of Mount Olives and recite loudly the Ten Commandments. Twain replied, Have you ever thought about just staying home and keeping them? <laughs> well, we live in strange times. A Gallup poll received and revealed that 84% of the American public believes that the Ten Commandments are a valid guide to life. That's encouraging. But the same survey revealed that only 30% of those polled could name three of the commandments. So, how many can you name? And then what about the meanings as well? <laughs> and so when we read the commandments from Exodus chapter 20, You'll have to decide if there are 10 or 11, or if they're correct or wrong in Luther's small catechism. But here they are. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any graven image. You shall not bow down and worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor his, your white neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The sad reality is that most American children will grow up and not know anything about the Ten Commandments. Several years ago, the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional a Kentucky law that required the Ten Commandments to be posted in public classrooms. The Supreme Court ruled that posting the Ten Commandments would unnecessarily entangle church and state. Now while making that ruling, right above their head in stone was Moses and the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court building itself. The men, of 1750, the men of 1776 who wrote the Constitution would be utterly amazed by that ruling. They assumed that all children in every classroom would learn the Ten Commandments. They regarded their work as resting on that legal, historical foundation that went all the way back to Mount Sinai. To use the Constitution against the Ten Commandments would have seemed ridiculous, outlandish. These commandments are the basis for a civil society. Unfortunately, we live in a day when the outlandish has become the law of the land. The American courts are really only answering the question, can these Ten Commandments be posted or should they be removed from the public venues? Well, some things may be settled by the court. And while the courts may have removed the Ten Commandments from the classroom, they have not found a replacement for the rules that create a civil society. If they remove one, don't you think they should find other rules for a civil society? Our present culture has sought to silence any mention of God and His precepts in our own time and to our own harm. So without the Ten Commandments, what will the rules be for our civil society. 
How will truth be arrived? We live in a day when the very concept of objective morality is being questioned. And so it goes. It may be right for you, but how do I know what's right for me? Take our own wonderful state against one of these commandments called thou shalt not steal. What's the latest ruling? Oh, hey, you can go into Target, you can go into Fan you can go into Zeros, you can go into East where you want, and you can take whatever you want as long as it's just under $950. Above that, it's stealing. That's moral relativism. The concept of absolute standard is jettisoned. And we're left with nothing but idealism. A society adrift, a boat on an ocean without sail, a rudder. Without an absolute standard, how do we measure right from wrong? Well, there's only three answers. One could be human feeling. I seem to remember Debbie Boone having a song, How Can It Be Wrong When It Feels So Right? So, human feeling. The second could be majority vote. How can it be wrong if 55% of the people vote for it? The problem with these first two is that feelings change and the majority often shifts its position. And we're left with shifting and uncertain sands of moral relativism. And what will we do if, well, your feelings conflict with my feelings? Who is right then? Third option, we need an absolute standard that is unchanging and unchangeable. Years ago, Ted Koppel delivered the commencement address at Duke University. And in that address, he asked this question. Where can we go to find truth that will stand the test of time? He went on to say, in its purest form, truth is not a polite tap on the shoulder. What Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not the ten suggestions. They are commandments. And the sheer beauty of the commandments is that they codify in a handful of words acceptable human behavior, not just for then or now, but for all time. End of quote. So why did God give the ten commandments in the first place? Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you tell your children not to play in the street? out of love and protection. The Ten Commandments were given by God out of love for us, to protect us. If you love someone, and you love them enough, to love them enough to say no. Before God gave the Ten Commandments, He redeemed the children of Israel from 400 years of slavery. When the children of Israel were hungry in the wilderness, He fed them. When they were thirsty in the wilderness, He gave them water. When God said, Thou shalt not, He simply was saying, don't hurt yourself. These are not ten suggestions for a better life. They are not ten ways you should consider. Nor ten habits for highly successful people. Nor ten ways to climb the ladder. So, can the Ten Commandments regulate Christian behavior? Yes, of course. As well as society. But we are not saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. I think Paul settles that matter conclusively in the book of Romans. He said no one can get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments because no one can keep them perfectly except Jesus. Jesus was born into a world that did not want him, into a nation whose monarch tried to murder him when he was an infant. His hometown tried to assassinate him. The religious rulers plotted against him. He was betrayed by a man whom he had picked to be a close friend. His own church trumped up charges against him. The respected pillars of society tried to trip him up just so they could bring him down. He was sent to die on a cross by a man who knew he was innocent. And from his human birth in Bethlehem stable to his death on the cross, followed by his resurrection from death in the grave, Jesus proved that all who believe in him even though they have broken their commandments or their ethical standards, under the cross they are erased by faith in Jesus. For they were nailed to the cross and they were left there, Paul writes in Colossians. 
out of love. If by chance you have been confused by all the religions of the world while searching for absolute guidelines for your behavior, if you have been seeking rules that would create a civil society because you know from experience that relativism fails, you know, you're okay, my okay, my rules work for me, but maybe they won't work for you. Then listen to what Martin Luther points out about the uniqueness of Christianity in the small catechism. And so he writes the small catechism. It's a simple book to help parents explain God's concerns with the Ten Commandments and other articles of the Christian faith. God's love and his offer of salvation. Also in that small catechism, Martin Luther writes... I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. That's a very good statement. It's a little too long, maybe. So, let me make it easy. Listen to the first two words. I cannot. That's it, two words. I cannot is the confession which sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. If you investigate the hundreds of religions, the thousands of belief systems, the tens of thousands of divinities which have appeared and then faded from the pages of human history, if you do, you will find that they all say, you must try. You must try to bridge that gulf of broken ethical standards, that gulf of broken commandments that has separated you from your Creator. You must try to pay the price. For all that you've done wrong. You must try to find a way to transform your God's frown into a smile. You must try. In trying, they have worshipped cows. Deified cats and rats. Some have run hooks through their bodies and suspended themselves in midair. You must try, said the God of the Aztecs. As they try to appease their gods by tearing the beating heart out of the chest of human sacrifices. I could go on, but you get the point. God has given us the Ten Commandments out of love. Each of the commandments gives us insight into the character of God. God does not want us to hurt others. And so he says, do not murder. God does not want us to hurt others. And so he says, do not slander. God does not want us to hurt others. He doesn't want marriage destroyed. Do not commit adultery. He does not want us to hurt others or rob others. And so he says, do not steal. Which reminded me of a movie that I once saw in life a few years ago. Maybe you've seen it as well. It's about a fictional character called Robin Hood. Now Robin Hood was either played by Earl Flynn in black and white, or by Kevin Costner in color. So Robin Hood's a swashbuckling movie with action, <coughs> archery, skill. There's romance. Robin Hood was handsome, daring, romantic, courageous, compassionate, kind, loyal. But there's one thing you must still must admit. Robin Hood was a crook. He was a thief. He broke that commandment. So why the Ten Commandments? I think there are three reasons. One, confrontation. What kind of people need to be told, don't steal, don't slander, don't murder, on, on, and on? People who are selfish. And God is confronting us. It's like a mirror. He wants us to look at and say, how have you done? And you have to say, not well. I need help. And he offers Jesus. Second, each commandment offers instruction. Each commandment charts a new path for us to walk. So, you shall not steal guides us into the ways of generosity and fairness and honesty and moderation and timely payments and faithful promises. Each commandment was given to guide us into a civil society where we could not injure one another with words our weapons. Third, each commandment is a promise. If you keep these, you will live. You will experience the abundant life. The rich, smart, young Jewish lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to earn eternal life? 
Jesus asked him, well, how do you read your Bible? What does it say? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. In other words, you will create and experience what it means to have an abundant, peaceful life, a civil society. So when we keep the commandments, we will be imitating Jesus, improving civil society, and we will love God and our neighbor. May it be so as you continue to study these Ten Commandments this week. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep your hearts and minds growing in the faith. Let us stand. And this morning we'll be using uh, Martin Luther's second article to the uh, Apostles' Creed and his definition as our confession.